I mean, here with my Victoria's Secret bag because today's um, topic is soup, and I think soup is sexy. It's the new sexy. So I just wanted to, um, to you know, th that's my that's my uh, my segue into the history of soup and how that looks. So um, <coughs> out of my Victoria's Secret bag, we'll we'll see how things go. But again, soup, in my opinion, has become sexy again, and so we'll see what Victoria's Secret reveals for us. Um, so a little bit, we've got all sorts of us who are going to speak about some of the different aspects of soup, but I just wanted to, because I'm not, um, I'm not that historical, I just wanted to give you a little bit of the pieces of, of the, the history of soup. So, um, food historians tell us that the history of soup is probably as old as the history of cooking. I guarantee you that this soup is not that old that we're eating today. So, um, but the act of combining various ingredients in a large pot to create a nutritious and fi um, filling and easily digested, simple to make and serve food was inevitable just through the history of cooking. Um, so it made the, the, it made soup the perfect choice for folks who were sedentary or for the traveling cultures as well throughout history. Um, rich and poor, healthy and um, invalid, um, all sorts of people would enjoy soup. Um, soup, stew, pottage, porridge, gruel, you get the picture, right? So um, all of that evolved using local ingredients and tastes. And so we came up with New England chowder, Spanish gazpacho, Russian borscht, Italian minestrone. What kind of lamb stew do we have today? Stefano. Stefano lamb stew, Chinese wonton soup, and Campbell's. <laughs> okay, so there we go, there we go. So all of that is kind of, um, it's regional and we are no different here in Rowe County, you know? So that was some of the piece that I feel is this theme about soup. Um, so again, soups were easily digested, prescribed for invalids in ancient times. They were um, really the, um, the creation of modern restaurants were part of this whole soup thing because um, they're called restore. Res, one more time, restoratives. That's like the root of restaurants. The first restaurants were serving soups in the 18th century of Paris, right? So this is kind of like the evolution of soup. Um, and then advancements in science enabled soup to take many forms. It became portable, right? Our our portable soup that my son used to take up the skier every day for for lunch. Um, dehydrated. Dehydrated chicken noodle soup, ready to go. Put it in the water, add your chicken, you're good to go. Um, reconstituted with a little bit of water, kind of those microwavable, all sorts of different things. Soup has filled the niche for colonial travelers, people who were in chuck wagons coming this way, cowboy chuck wagons, the home pantry. Advances in science have um, allowed soup to just be one of those things that we have had for lots of years and, and it's still becoming um, it's evolving as we go and, and it's sexy, right? So, um, so <laughs> the other thing that I wanted to just share is like this whole soup word, right? Soup has um, had its place in history over the, the years and the word soup um, really, it started out meaning the act of like this sliced bread and then there was the broth on top of it which was the sop, right? Mm -hmm. And so this whole piece was really, quite um, ingenious because you've got this bread that allows you to sop it up and you don't need any utensil, right? No spoons necessary, all that kind of thing. So sop and sup kind of became the root word of supper, which is our, usually the main meal was the big heavy meal at lunchtime and supper became the end of the day meal, which was kind of a soup or supper kind of thing. So I felt like that was kind of just, it kind of brings us to, the, the, there's just lots of ways that soup connects all of us to every day and we are in. So um, so then if we want to connect that to this whole Fair Family Favorites, which is really kind of the history of a lot of local recipes here that we've put together. Um, if you take a look in it, we have this great soup and salad um, area in the book and there's lots of um, sexy new soups which is really great we have some of the people who've who've 
submitted recipes here in this very room, so if you bought your copy, they might even autograph your recipe book. Um, but as we go through it, there's actually one on page 37, there's this one recipe, which I just got such a big kick out of when we were discovering recipes for the book. And it's Edith Summer, her husband Vernon is right there on the wall. Um, they have since um, gone on to be part of the Annals of History here. But Edith's um, recipe was for petite marmite. Marmite. I don't even know how you would say that. How do you say it? Marmot. Okay. Marmot. But, but no, not marmot. it's not marmot because there's no marmot listed. Marmot. But it's however it is, it's, it's kind of a sexy title for this the soup. But it it lists four pounds of shin of beef. Who's bought shin of beef at the grocery store recently? <laughs> Um, two pounds of chicken wings and necks, very important parts of soup. Um, then your chicken broth, the different spices that people actually, you know, did. It wasn't just a spice packet that you bought in your thing. Um, celery, turnips, onion, cabbage, and then bread, of course, a crusty bread to serve with the soup. So I just kind of felt like that was, that's like the old style kind of um, way that soup evolved. And we're going to have Linda Long here to tell us out how some of the historical pieces of soup, um, how that looks. So I'll let Linda take over and, and talk about that. And then we'll um, also have another gal, um, Katie Fletcher, who will be here to talk about some things. And we'll wrap it all up for you. And, it, and it'll all still be sexy. So I'll just leave sexy here. <laughs> OK, maybe, maybe not. If it gets in the way, you just let me know. So let's welcome Linda Long. Well, it's hard to follow Nancy, as everybody knows. So, but happy thing, St. Patrick's Day. I'm glad you guys are here with us. Um, I have some artifacts on the table here that uh, go back into the 40s and the 30s with my grandmother and my mother when they used to do a lot of the soups, but they would can it. We didn't have electricity. I'm from Kijiri Creek area up by Taconis, Yampa is where I grew up. And that's where my family homesteaded and, you know, and everything. So we are from that area. We were uh, quite a ways from a grocery store, so we had to be pretty well self-sufficient, especially through the winter months. And it didn't really matter. Summer months wasn't a whole lot better for travel. But anyway, we, we would pretty much was self-sufficient. We, we put everything into our cellars for food, and uh, we took care of it as, as we needed to. Um, we would, uh, in the fall, we would try to butcher cow uh, for all the families, and we would have elk and deer and all of those kind of different meats. Uh, chickens, I've got a way to butcher your chickens right here, if anybody wants to see that. Um, I've got ways to can your food, so or any of that kind of stuff. And uh, so anyway, I have some artifacts here. These are the jars that we would have canned in. We would have put our meats, our chicken, especially chickens, into this one because the whole chicken would fit. So these are the size of jars. Today we don't can in these kind of jars. They use them for a lot of storages and, and that kind of stuff. But, but they don't can in the half gallons and because it, they figure it's not as safe as it used to be. This one here is a quart and a lot of the, of the food would be put up in the quart jars. And so anyway, when we would would uh, in the fall we would try to harvest all of our meat. I do have up here in the front anybody that would like to pick them up. Thanks to the Ag Alliance, they have these cuts of meat. I've got one for beef, one for lamb, and one for pork. And so you're welcome to pick up any of those uh, and take them with you if you'd like. Um, and it shows all the different cuts of meat. My dad. If you would have come to our ranch, we had a meat shed, and it was just a wooden shed away from the house, out back. It would have been wooden. It would have had screens on the window, no windows. It would have just had a shutter that would have shut the, the, the wind out when we were working in there, or the snow, or whatever might have been there. And that was away from the house a little bit. It would have had a wood floor, and we would have about 12 inches of sawdust on the floor. 
after we got through butchering, us kids got the pleasure of cleaning all that sawdust out and we would put new sawdust down. Uh, but that was the way of sanitizing and keeping everything clean. Um, and that's the way that we would, uh, we would prepare the meat. My dad had in the beef, I remember a big wall chart that he had hanging in that room and it gave him all the different cuts of the meat that he would be able to cut up. I, was, I grew up very lucky that my grandfather and my father both were very, very good in preparing the meats. So I learned from them and, and, and did very well that way. Uh, so I still do take care of my meat. But anyway, we would have had um, all the meat prepared there and my grandmother or my mom, one of them, would have ordered from Montgomery Ward a bolt of material, which would have been the whole bolt of material that you go to the store to buy today. And it would have came in the mail. And it would have been a light, canvas type material, a denim type material, something heavy that we could cut it up and we'd wrap. I happened to learn how to sew straight stitches because in July we would say, my grandmother would say, well we're getting ready to do meat, we need some sacks made. And so we would cut them, fold them in half, sew the bottom and sew up the side. And I'd make them this long or I could make them this long, to take a whole shoulder or whatever. So I learned how to sew on the meat sacks, and at least straight stitches anyway. So we would, we would uh, prepare those starting maybe in July, June, whenever it was rainy and we acted like we were bored, we always got something to do. So that was one of those things that we got to do. Um, if you walked in on our back porch, our back porch would have had a counter. It would have had a place for all of your um, Hats, coats, gloves, everything would have been hanging on the wall. Over in the corner would have been our cream separator for our milk. We would have had buckets sitting there for uh, things to take down to the pigs. And, you know, that would have been on our back porch. If you had walked just a little bit further, there was a trap door there. At the trap door, if you opened it up, it went down into our basement. That's where we kept all of our fresh vegetables. Our, our potatoes, onions, corn. Um, we never really got to raise corn, but we would get some from Grand Junction when they'd come with the peddler. Uh, we would have a little bit of tomatoes there as long as they would last. And most of that fresh, and turnips was another one, cabbage was another. Those would all be down in the basement. But we would can everything else that so that we didn't lose any of those that food because there was after Thanksgiving, there was no going to the grocery store and finding any of those things even on the shelf. I don't care how much money you had, it just wasn't on the shelf at that time. So we would have to can it, and we had to, didn't have uh, electrical um, probably till the mid-50s in a lot of the rural ranches. A lot of people in town had it a little bit before then. But out in the rural area, we didn't get electricity till into the mid 50s. So we had no <coughs> freezers or any of that kind of stuff. So those meat bags, my mom or my dad would, would <coughs> put a nice roast into one of those smaller bags, and we would wrap it up really, really tight, and we would lay it out, <coughs> weather permitting, and it would cooperate with us. It would freeze it. And when it got frozen solid, then we had a spring house that was in the back of the porch. You stepped over that, that uh, cover that I had talked about going down to, for the trap door going down to the basement. And you walked through another door, which was a screen house in the back. And again, it was just a screen. If we wanted to shut it, we had shutters there that we could shut. But it was a wooden ice box, and literally that's what it was. We would have layers of ice layers of sawdust, and then another layer of ice, and we would have refrigeration out there. That was our refrigeration. It kept our meat, it kept our milk, our butter, all of those kind of items on the back porch that was handy. Otherwise, we had a spring house, a waste from the house, that the water ran through constantly all winter long, because that's where we had to haul the water back up to the house with. And so we would have a space in there also that we could keep fresh meat and extra butter or eggs or any of those kind of things. So we had two different places. We had 
a fairly large family, so we need both of those. And then in the, in the fall, when we was doing a lot of the meat, the elk and the, the deer and the beef and pork and every, everything out, the lambs that we did, we would put them in our granary. And the granary was built tight, so we didn't get a lot of, we didn't get any rodents in there, every, you know, we didn't get, but we always put everything in a bag. And, but we made fresh bags every year because that was just the way we did it, you know. So um, those were the kind of the way that we did everything. Along about this time of the year, March and April, I have a, <coughs> a book here that belonged to my grandmother and my mom, and it was a, a lovely, I'll pass it around here, but it was a, a lovely little book that they put out with the USDA, and it was put out in 1924, and it gave us the whole year of how to prepare our foods from the can jars. And so for the month of March, it would give you the full menus of how to use all your canned goods and, and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I'll send this around. And the the book is, is up here, but I've got several canning books here of different ideas, you know, and everything like that. But this was kind of a cool way that they taught all of the the wives and the mothers, you know, how to, it's, you just, just turn it around. That's all. Um, anyway, you, that's how we kind of got a different idea, otherwise you kind of got in a rut and you see sort of the same things. So when in March would come, we would try to start using up everything. We had, you know, the meats were going to thaw, the vegetables were going to get roots and start growing again, you know, those kind of things. That's when we made our soups. We would take our soups and, you know, you kind of almost dreaded, I dreaded the mud, but it was a lot of work too because it was like a panic time for the family that we got to get all this food taken care of before it starts to spoil. So that's when we would start filling these jars with, with chicken noodle soups or we would fill it with beef and vegetable soup or we would feed it, fill it with ham and beans or, or those kind of things. But then that kept us going all summer long. But we would use up all of those vegetables and all the meat that was still frozen and still in the cellars that we would try to get rid of so that we didn't waste anything because we had nothing to waste, you know, we just couldn't. So those were the things that, um, as a child, I remember, you know, that it was a lot of work and to make that pot of soup, it was, uh, we didn't have Campbell's. <laughs> so we, we had a lot of work to do. Um, I brought these artifacts because the significance of them is we lived in, in Jarrah Park up by Taponis, which we were close to the sawmills of, of the Taponis and on Five Pine Mesa and all those. And they would give you the, the sawdust. So we would take wool sacks, and us kids thought it was just more fun than everything to fill these sacks and get sawdust everywhere, you know. But we, we would fill those sacks full of sawdust to bring back to the ranch, and they would take the wagon up and, and bring them back. So anyway, the, what I've done or brought here is this is a homemade knife that my father made. It's cut up, if we had this much meat, we could feed the town of Steamboat several times. Uh, it's cut up a lot. And it was made from a saw blade from the Strutzel's sawmill in Taponis. And I made the, the thing, and I've got the history of it on the back of it. But this is, um, it's it come out of the timber camps. You can see where to cut through this frozen meat, they use a hammer and cut it down so you can kind of see the edges of it here, you know, that they've done that. And, but this is one of them that, that he made. This is a hold it up so we can see it? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It'll be laying on the table up here. But, but it's just got rivets for the handle, just, just some oak wood that he took. And anyway, it's really a, a nice knife to cut up a lot of steaks and different things because it was, it was big. This one here, yes I do. Um, this one here is another one that was made like that. And then this little one was made. And they're all just the wooden handles. There's nothing 
special about them, but that was what we had to do. We had to make our own tools in a lot of ways because <coughs> it really wasn't available to buy it, you know. So uh, my parents was very resourceful, my grandparents were, and we just made what we needed, you know. So I brought these just kind of to show it off and let you know what, you know, how we used to do that, you know. So anyway, I've got the history on the back of this one, and I made the scabbard several years ago. Um, that it's, it's just kind of cool. And, but anyway, those come from sawmills. There were sawmills on Sarvers Creek, there were sawmills in Taponas, King Mountain, on the Gore, Five Pine Mesa, there was, all in that area, there was a lot of sawmills. And so that was just old saw blades that had been worn out and they just would take them and make them for all the neighbors and make them for Christmas and that's the way we do it. So. Does anybody have any questions? All this stuff you guys can look at. If you want to pick up one of these, uh, you guys can pick up the cuts of meat and do that. Um, and I'll turn it over to you. Yes. Linda, what did you do with the canning? How did you get a hot bath or whatever? Did you have a wood stove? We had, or a, we had a wood stove, stove coal and stove. coal stove. Yeah, just a kitchen stove. And we had a pressure canner. And because all your soups need to be pressure canned. Mm -hmm. and, and all so, your vegetables and things. Did you have a hot bath? How did you? We pressured all of our, and anything that you would put in the suits mainly had meat in it, and most of your, uh, so we had to pressure can most of all, all of your uh, soups that would be done. You know, if you did a bean and ham soup, that had to be pressured. Vegetable in, beef. In the, in the bottle? Yes, in this jar. You put it in the jar and then pressure can. Put it down in the pressure canner. And then, um, if you was just going to eat it fresh, of course you could just put it on the stove, you know, and eat it fresh. But if you were going to preserve it for any length of time, you have to put it in the jar. And all the meat that you froze in that day, was it cooked or raw? We pre-cooked ours, and I have recipes here that we followed in, in, you know, all of these old books. And it tells you, you know, I mean, there's cuts of, um, of meat, like liver paste. Uh, <laughs> heart, uh, where you can can heart, uh, all of those items, and, and so they're kind of, these are old books, and I don't use them anymore, I just keep them for fun, and they belong to my family, and so I preserve them, <coughs> but I've got the recipes kind of copied on the back from the books that's in the front, and it tells you how to do all of those kind of well, things. Well, even roasts and steaks and stuff, you pre-cooked and froze? We did. At, we didn't freeze it. We well, they were frozen, and then when they started thawing out, that's when we would put them in the jars. But we would put pork chops, we would put steak, we'd put roast, uh, hamburger. We'd make hamburger patties, and we had wide mouth jars like these, and you could just make your patties so big, and then you dropped each one of them down in. Then when you got them out in the summertime, you had a regular hamburger. So. You know, I mean, that's just the way we, and I think I've got that recipe for support to me. So it sounds so, like you pretty much canned everything versus freezing. Well, we had dry. no freezer, so we had to work with the weather. If it was a, if it was a spring like we're having now, we would have started in February when we started getting the meats thawing out and all those kind of things. February, we would have started canning because it wouldn't have held. So you know, you I mean, even if we had the blocks of ice, you could see that it was starting to get ice crystals in it. So you could start. freeze first and then yes. can if you started to lose that, right. rather than lose the meat. Right. And in the fall, we would can everything, you know, for our tomatoes and all of that. And then even in a lot of these recipes that I've brought, it'll show you that when we're making the soup, you would make, you would take and open up a can of, or a jar of, tomatoes to put into that recipe so they would be canned twice, you know, basically. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's how we would do it. And it was just because that was only food preservation that we had. And we had no electricity, we had no freezer, we had none of that kind of stuff, you know. We just when did you get all that? When did it really drastically Probably change? about 55 or somewhere in And then you moved to more freezing? Then we, yes. Oh, we thought, when we got to the freezer, we thought we had bought the Cadillac. <laughs> uh, because the Cadillac was, it was so nice, you know. But then we, we in the rural area, um, even today, I mean, I, I lose power with every storm, you know. So it's still not, 
real satisfying, you know, in your heart to know that it'll be safe forever, you know, in a deep freeze, because you never know if you're going to lose it for three or four days or whatever. So when it first come on, it really wasn't dependable, but we thought it was, like I said, the Cadillac. We thought it was wonderful. So, so I'm going to turn this over. Oh, I have a question. Okay. When you did get to the grocery store, where was your grocery store? In Usually Yampa? in Taponas or Yampa. Uh, and we could buy everything by cases in both stores. So we would buy case lots of whatever, you know. And, and like Costco. Uh -huh. Yeah, we <laughs> did. And, but they had, uh, and, and Ikebetos in Pittsburgh had a delivery truck, and you could give them a call when we did get phones, because that was later too, and you could call them and give them the order, and then they would bring it up and deliver it all the way up there up the highway there for um, so that was a way that we could get it also so but it helped a lot that way yes when you use the that kind of jar mm -hmm. and you're pressure cooking and it, do you screw it on partially and then it evacu the air evacuates they had a rubber that went inside of it and you just give it a finger tight when it's done fresh with this no when you're before when you're putting it in there it in. yeah and then it sucks a seal so we're going to have uh, at the Sears Extension office on April 22nd we're going to have a meat or a soup canning class uh, on April 22nd through through the CSU extension. So if anybody is really interested in kind of coming to see how we do it, uh, we're going to be having that class there. So so I'll give that little piece there. Yes? You still can your meat today though, don't you, Linda? Yes, I do. Yeah, I still can. It's so handy. And it is. I can have supper in 20 minutes and mm -hmm. it's like going to McDonald's. Did this whole role get, get the sign in sheet? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank so, you. so Linda talks about life on the ranch, but there's lots of ways that soup has um, a part of the Route County history, and we're going to let Katie Fletcher talk uh, about um, an, another take on soup. Well, there were several of us having lunch discussing the Methodist soup lunch in the fall, and I said, oh yes, and so we got to talking about how uh, soup lunches have always been money makers as well as just feeding your families, and I don't know how long the church over here has had soup lunches, but I know it's been a long time. I, I was here in the 70s, and... Uh, <coughs> We used to have just church bazaars, and <clears throat> excuse me, someone said, oh, "Well, let's have a soup lunch." And so the idea was that everyone makes their favorite roast uh, beef stew and bring it and put it in a big pot. And actually, we had a big pot; <laughs> it was huge, but it was in two or three pots. And the lady in charge of the soup that day would take these soups that were coming in from all the different ladies and putting them in the pot and stirring them and making sure that each pot was mixed. And it's always been a delicious soup. It isn't quite done that way right now. Uh, we just had a meeting last month where we tasted different kinds of soups that maybe we'll have. Uh, soup has always been a staple for hearty meals. Tom Ross talked about the fable of stone soup in 2008, it was in the entertainment magazine that we have, and where someone starts and is boiling stones, and the people come by and say, what are you making? Oh, stone soup. And it'd be a little better if it had a potato in it, or an <laughs> onion in it, or a carrot, or chicken wings, or maybe beef shins. <laughs> and then it would... So the soup stewed all day, and with all the additions, it was a delicious soup. Um, I was thinking of one of the examples of advertising for our church soups. And uh, when we had church bazaars, we, always, we had a theme. And one year it was Raggedy Ann and Andy, and we were all making Raggedy Ann and Andy dolls. And that was in the early 70s. And Steamboat 
well, two people dressed up like Raggedy Ann and Andy and went downtown. But most of the stores were between 6th Street and 9th Street, so we went in the stores and told people to come have soup that day in costume. <laughs> when making soup, different ladies use different bases. Nowadays, they might buy V8 juice and have that for a base for their stew. Or uh, one year, John, Zucchi uh, John Lucchini excuse me, <laughs> contributed a special French roux that we could add to the soups to flavor it and season it. And each time, it just was delicious. All agree that soup is the best when it's stewed for maybe four hours and just sat and absorbed all the flavors. Over the years, I've received good soup recipes. Uh, Winnie Lee and Lucy McGregor had both had a good chicken chili recipe that's been passed around. One day I was talking to Susie Crowner from Yampa, and she had a lot of vegetables in her grocery cart, and she said, oh, it's a taco soup I made. So I, she sent me the recipe, and it's in a Grand Slammers cookbook from South Route about this taco soup. Another is a turkey minestrone soup that I got from other people. And of course, the Fair Family Favorites recipe book has many more yummy soups. Uh, the only time I made an unusual soup was uh, last year when they were talking about uh, cooking with wood stoves. And Tamara mentioned that, like squirrel soup, and I said, oh, I just happened to have a dressed squirrel in my freezer. <laughs> <laughs> my grandson had been hunting with his dad at Christmas, and they forgot to take it with it when they left. So I only had one squirrel. My son-in-law told me later I needed six squirrels to make good soup to have enough. <laughs> I, I added chicken, and it, was, it didn't taste different than chicken soup. <laughs> there wasn't that much squirrel soup. But I just hope that you all have good soup recipes and yummy, yummy. <laughs> Is, that's a new cookbook, right? That's just coming out from the South Route area? Yeah. Is it out? It's already out. There are some copies here at the at museum. museum. Cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So what, when Marcia and I were talking about this and we were talking about um, having Community Ag Alliance and all that kind of stuff come together to talk about soup and I'm like, well, how, why is soup important? And I just feel like it's this amazing chapter of our lives because it's something that has been around since the Middle Ages and it's still here now. And we've gone through the phases where you used to be able to go to the butcher and get a few cuts that would be perfect for um, for stew meat or that kind of thing. If you buy your beef or your animal from the Route County Fair or the 4-H kids, you're gonna get some of those kind of things. But now it's kind of hard to go to just, there's not a butcher at City Market. There's not, I mean, they have meat departments, but the butcher kind of piece is, is a little bit missing now. And so, um, there, so it's just kind of a, a different thing. But we do have lots of ways where locals can, um, can connect with producers like some of the ladies who have made the soup back here. And I think Marsha might be able to tell us a little bit more about that, um, the connection that we can make with um, the, f the food that we're making and the people that are growing some of that food that we're able to do. So Marsha with the commission, the Community <laughs> Agriculture of Alliance is here. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to three of my board members for Community Agri Agriculture Alliance who cook for you today. Uh, Jeannie Maniotis with Prime Mountain Lamb, and she made the lamb. Adele Carlson with Sand Mountain Cattle, and she made the beef stew. And Karen Massey with the CSU Extension, she's our director, and she made the vegetable stew using Lisa Williams' recipe. It was Lisa Williams' recipe, and that's in the Fair Family Favorites and then, unfortunately, the young lady who made the, the cornbread today had to go back to work. But she, I wanted you to know that she's about 26 years old, and she used her grandmother's recipe. So that makes it pretty special, too. Um, Candace, if you, um, this coming week is Ag Appreciation Week throughout Route County. And you're going to be walking around seeing a lot of these signs throughout the community. If you would take time to go in and thank the businesses or the partners 
that Ag Alliance has. They are the ones that are making things happen and really helping to preserve agriculture in Route County. Um, so Candace, here's your, your door poster. Thank you for being one of our better partners. Coffee. Yes. <laughs> the artwork was done by a local artist named Adam Zabel and he, uh, the drawing is of a Yampa Valley farm, he called it, we corrected him and told him it was a ranch, but down around the Yampa area, actually. Um, on your seats, there is uh, one of the postcards, and it has all the different events that Community Agriculture Alliance is sponsoring during the next, really, 10 days. We kind of, well, like ranchers and farmers, everything takes longer than you think it should. Um, but these are all different events throughout the community, and we'd invite you to go and uh, partake of them. Different venues, different ideas, different things that are happening all the time. And then on the back of the postcard are some of the restaurants that are serving local um, foods. Um, and we're very, very proud of those restaurants. The ones that are listed here are not everyone who is, um, does serve local foods, but they are ones who are helping Ag Alliance this week by providing a special and uh, will help uh, provide part of the proceeds into Ag Alliance. So if you go into a restaurant this week or into a business, be sure to thank them for, for helping out local agriculture. And if you wear your button, they'll know that you're part of the, the Naked and Hungry. So my question to you is, where would all of you be without agriculture? Naked and hungry. Let's try it again. Where would you be without agriculture? Naked and hungry. That's very true. Please keep that in mind. And, and this Lots week, dinner. pick up the phone and call a rancher or farmer that you know and thank them for their hard work and all that they do for agriculture to make your life a lot easier. But in the meantime, we can make your life easier. And if you would like to participate and um, actually buy local foods, Community Agriculture Alliance has an online website. We have over 50 producers who are providing meats, eggs, honeys, sauces, potatoes, greens when they're available. <laughs> it's kind of hard this time of year, but we do have. And um, there's also uh, the opportunity to buy whole animals or parts of animals, uh, both Adele and um, Jeannie are providing packages of meats along with some other meat producers. Um, it's an online market. We do carry the products, um, or the producers bring the products in after you've ordered them and you can pick them up on Friday just right across the street in the Sequoia building. So I'd certainly encourage you to support local agriculture to get the really good food and um, enjoy every soup that you make or every steak that you grill, every hamburger that you fry, knowing that there's been a rancher and a farmer who put their heart and soul into your food. And we're glad to do it. We are glad that the, you support the American rancher and farmer every day. Marsha, what street is it? Is it like a block back this way? It's, it's on the corner of Ninth and Oak, so it's just Ninth a block of coast. Okay. Uh -huh. you, we can, you can pick up some things like the honeys, some meats, eggs, uh, on a limited basis throughout the week, but we really encourage you to pre-order and pick things up on Friday. And it's all online. Is it is all online. Way, only way it works is online. Oh, you can stop in and pick things up, but it's online. Mm -hmm. That's the best way. Okay, Nancy, thank you. So I want to show of hands, anybody agree with me that soup is still sexy? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, so we're going to let Tamara, I want to thank Tamara and Candace and the whole museum staff for putting um, some of these things together and connecting us with some of the reasons that, you know, food is the feel-good thing. I'll, I'll let you guys um, wrap it up, but thanks for coming today, thanks for supporting local agriculture, and thanks to our ladies for making the yummy soup, lovely, lovely.